I'm beginning our presentation this time this morning in Ephesians 1, 3, and 4, if you want to turn there with me. Everybody has their Bibles? Yes? Good. Blessed be the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, who has blessed us with every spiritual blessing in the heavenly places in Christ, just as he chose us in him before the foundation of the world, that we would be holy and blameless before him. In love, he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the beloved. I want you to see that word, in the beloved. Today I have a very simple message for you from the Lord. It is a one word message actually. It's the most profound message in the Bible. And without this message, everything else that we have to say today will make no sense at all. You have to know this before you can move on. You're going to wonder why I just didn't say the word and sit down and be done. Because you wouldn't believe me. Simple as that. You wouldn't believe me. I know that because I struggled with it myself. Still do sometimes. So we're going to take a longer journey. We're going to explore the scriptures along the way and see where we come out. And then we'll see whether you believe that this is true or not. Turn with me to Ephesians 1, verse 1. And notice what Paul... Oh, do you have your Bibles? You have to have your Bibles. <laughs> okay. Note what Paul is writing to the Ephesians. Paul, an apostle of Jesus Christ by the will of God to the saints who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. Now, let's see. Um, this letter is written to the saints and those who are faithful. A little lesson in Greek. Not, not a big one, a little one. The Greek word chi. It's translated into English as and. You see that and in there? Who are at Ephesus and who are faithful in Christ Jesus. It doesn't always mean and also. Like when I went to the beach, I took an umbrella and a book and a beach ball. I this, this, and I took this, and I took this. It can also mean this. When I went to the beach, I took a book and also an umbrella and also a beach ball. But the Greek in Kai can also mean and therefore, or in other words. So let's go back to our greeting from Paul to the Ephesians with our new understanding of the Greek. And a Paul, an apostle of Christ Jesus by the will of God to the saints, who are at Ephesus, in other words, who are faithful in Christ Jesus. So, now, with that new understanding, let's take a look at Colossians 1, verse 2. To the saints who are also the brethren in Christ who are in Colossae. Okay, same message. Philippians 1, to all the saints in Christ Jesus who were in Philippi, including the overseers and the deacons. <laughs> it would seem that some of the deacons are very holy people, elders and deacons. 
because that's what the word saint means. The word saint means, it comes from the same root word as sanctuary and sanctify, to set apart for God's special purpose. So, let's review what we have learned about the saints to whom Paul has been addressing his letters. In Ephesians, we read that the saints were faithful. In Philippians, we read that the saints were very holy people and set apart. I don't say this humorously now because deacons and elders are set apart, ordained by God through his church for God's special purpose. Oh yes, let's not forget the Corinthians. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 2, to the church of God which is at Corinth, to those who have been sanctified in Christ, saints by calling, with all who are in every place, call in the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, their Lord and ours. And we discover that saints are sanctified. They are set apart. Let's see, Paul says saints by calling, faithful, holy, sanctified, called to be saints. Turn with me to one more scripture, Colossians 3, verses 12 to 17. Now, this is going to be too long to put on a slide, so if you'll turn there, Colossians 3, 12 to 17, I'm going to read you what it says about the Colossians. And so, as those who have been chosen of God, holy and beloved, there you go, that's all those descriptions of the people, put on a heart of compassion, kindness, humility, gentleness, and patience, bearing with one another, forgiving each other, whoever has a complaint against anyone, just as the Lord forgave you, so also should you. And beyond all these things, Put on love, which is the perfect bond of unity. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, to which indeed you were called in one body, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ richly dwell within you with all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another with psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, singing with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do all in the name of the Lord Jesus, having given thanks through him to God the Father. This is a description of the saints to whom Paul has been writing his letters. Um, just a moment. We read one of our greetings from 1 Corinthians, didn't we? Aha. Uh -huh. Aren't those the church members who were jealous and fighting with each other? One was sleeping with his father's wife, taking each other to court, carousing in the local temples with the temple prostitutes, and fighting over the bread at communion. The saints that you know, in the church where you grew up, or in the church right here where you attend, do they sound more like the Colossians in chapter 3, or do they sound more like the Corinthians that we were hearing about here? Did Paul really address the Corinthians as saints? Let's pray. O oh, my Father, hear my prayers this morning. We are here to follow your word, here to follow your spirit, here to learn the most important thing you have for us to know, that we are loved that we are saints and greatly beloved. Oh my Father, we need to get this right. Before we can begin to appreciate or understand whatever else you have for us to hear, 
to learn or to do. Bring this home to our hearts in the precious name of Jesus we pray. Amen. How many of you have ever been in love? Okay, men, you need to get your hands up if you want dinner today, okay? There you go. All right. <laughs> today I brought the wedding vows for my wife and I. We wrote our own. And at the time we wrote them, we were in the depths of love. All those things that you read in the Song of Solomon, we were saying to each other right here. You can look at those later if you like. Nothing bawdry here. <clears throat> Being in love is an intense feeling. It's an intense time, an intimate time. And the one you love is beloved. It means loved by. It signifies that the person is loved by somebody. They are beloved. It doesn't have to occur in a male-female relationship. Parents call their children beloved. So-and-so son is loved by. These children are loved by or the beloved children of their parents. Beloved can refer to other relatives as well, although that usually isn't the case, not with relatives, but <clears throat> beloved can also be very special friends. These are two male friends of mine here in North Carolina, Douglas and Arthur. They're closer to me than my siblings. They are my brothers in the sense that they know all about me. I can tell them anything, and I have. I have their utmost confidence and trust, and they have mine. They hold me accountable, <laughs> and they love me. And I love them, and I tell them so. There are things we don't agree on. Art is a Republican, I'm a Democrat. So you can imagine that we have some very intense discussions and we still don't agree on some things. But those discussions are always with the knowledge that we love each other. Turn with me to Samuel chapter 18 and verse 1, if you would. Now it came about that when he had finished speaking to Saul, Jonathan, the soul of Jonathan, was knit to the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as himself. This is the kind of relationship that I have with Art and with Doug. I love them as I love myself. Have you ever been loved with that kind of love? Now be careful. That's a trick question. Think about it. Have you ever been loved by someone with that kind of love? Let me tell you about two men in the Bible who were greatly beloved. The first one was a shepherd boy who defended his sheep against a lion and a bear and defended the honor of his God against the insults of a Philistine giant. Let's read about it in 1 Samuel 17 and 36. If you'll turn there with me, I know it's up here, but it means more when you see it in your own Bible. I struggle a bit with people who have electronic Bibles because you can't mark them up. You can't study an electronic Bible. <laughs> like this. <laughs> you, you think about it, and you write something down, and then you write something else. And first thing you know, you've got things written all around because you're trying to remember the things that you've learned. Never mind. Okay. Enough commercial. Stop, stop, stop. <laughs> Your servant has killed both the lion and the bear, and this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them since he has taunted the armies of the living God. As David says here, Goliath had been taunting the Israelite army and insulting the God of Israel. Can you see him up there on that far hill? Yeah, shouting insults and cursing the God of Israel. And David responded with a curse of his own. David's curse on Goliath tells you 
what was in the heart of David and why he was not afraid to fight somebody three times his size. Verses 46 and 47. This day the Lord will deliver you up into my hands and I will strike you down and remove your head. And I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and the wild beasts of the earth that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel. And that all this assembly may know that the Lord does not liver, deliver by sword or by spear. For the battle is the Lord's and he will give you into our hands. Pretty brave words for a boy of probably 16, 17, 18 years old. He knew who God was. And God said to Samuel, described in Acts 13, 22, concerning whom he also testified and said, I have found David, the son of Jesse, a man after my own heart who will do all my will. Yes, I know. <laughs> We're talking about David here, the man of great passion, the David who lasted after another man's wife had her husband murdered and punished, he was punished by the loss of four of his own sons. But listen to what God says about him. Just keep in mind that the way God looks at things is not necessarily the way we do. For God does not look on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. Therefore in 1 Kings 14, 8, notice in the middle of the verse, God says about David, who followed me with all his heart. You have not been like my servant David, who kept my commandments and followed me with all his heart to do only that which was right in my eyes. The very name David is actually not a name. It's a title. It's given to the leader who is honored and people are devoted to him. It was called the David. It means beloved. The very name means beloved. And God loved him. Intensely. Okay, the second man that I want to describe to you today was captured by Nebuchadnezzar during the first siege of Jerusalem by the Babylonian army. He was only 18 when he was taken to Babylon. Okay, how did we get so far ahead? There we go. And educated at the University of Babylon along with his three friends. They graduated at the top of their class became notorious by refusing to worship the gods of Babylon, even under the threat of death. And this young man became the prime minister of Babylon, serving under three different kings, and continued to serve even when the regime changed and the Persians came to power. He continued to serve in the same office. The Persians knew who he was, and they wanted that intelligent man working for them. Daniel was a very different kind of man than David. He was a young man under control. From his diet to his dress, from his daily prayers to his amazingly tactful speeches. Not at all like David. This is what God says through Ezekiel. Even though these three men, Noah, Daniel, and Job, were in its midst by their own righteousness, they could only deliver themselves. In the scriptures, at least, we are told, never told, about a sin that Daniel committed. In fact, when God wants to give Ezekiel an example of a righteous man, these are the three he names, including Daniel. In Daniel 9, this man whom God mentions as righteous along with Noah and Job, now notice this, has been praying and fasting in sackcloth and ashes for our sin and the sin of my people. You see that? The righteous man is including himself among the people who have sinned. And God sends Gabriel with a message 
for the man Daniel. And it's in Daniel 9, 22 and 23. I don't know how many times I have read this and just cried my eyes out. Wouldn't you love to have God say this about you? Yes. Oh, Daniel, I have now come out to give you skill and understanding. At the beginning of your prayers, the commandment came out, and I have come to explain, for you are greatly beloved. Did you see that? You see how Daniel is being addressed here? For you are greatly beloved. Can you imagine any sweeter words coming from the mouth of God about you? About you, for you are greatly beloved. Two men, very much unlike, yet both greatly beloved by God. How much are you loved by God? How much? Do you know? Do you know who you are? So many of us don't know who we are. It's an old country song sung by the Statler brothers about who we are. They mention a certain man who is the husband to his wife, the brother to his sister, a son to his mother, an employee to his boss, the neighbor to the man next door, a fishing buddy to his friends, and the list goes on and on in the song. We fill many different roles in our lives. We are many different people from time to time. But in the relationship that counts, in the relationship that is core to the existence of every Christian. For in Him we live and move and have our being. The Greeks in Athens, the Christians in Corinth, the members of this church, what is your role in relationship to God? In the eyes of God, who are you? How does God see you? Are you beloved? Let me introduce you to one more person in the scriptures. He's also described there. This is the first place where he is spoken about. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I put my spirit upon him. He will bring forth justice to the nations. This person is called what in this scripture? What's the title? Service. My servant. Isaiah 11.1 1. Then a shoot will spring up from the stem of Jesse and a branch from his roots will bear fruit. What is he called here? The branch. Telling us about this person's lineage, Isaiah describes him as the branch out of the root of Jesse. Psalm 110, verse 1. The Lord says to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make you enemies a footstool for your feet. David calls him Lord. David says, the Lord says to my Lord. David calls him Lord. Daniel 9, 25. What's the title here? So you are to know and discern that from the issuing of a decree to restore and rebuild Jerusalem until Messiah the priest. Prince. Daniel calls him Messiah. John the Baptist also had a title for him in John 1 29. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And then this one we all know, Revelation 19 and verse 16. On his robe and on his thigh he had a name written, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Lots of descriptions because there were lots of different roles that he was fulfilling. Who is he? When God speaks of him, how does God describe, how does God describe him when God speaks of him? Mark 1 and verse 11, a voice came out of the heavens saying, you are my beloved son. Does Jesus know this? 
Does Jesus know the relationship that he's in with his Father? Mark 12.1 is a parable that Jesus told. A man planted a vineyard, built a wall around it, dug a vat under the wine press, built a tower, rented it out to the vine growers, and went on a journey. You know this story. The story is familiar to us. It was also familiar to those who were hearing the story. It's a very common story there in Jerusalem. The owner who sent the slaves to receive from the caretakers in the vineyard, <clears throat> and how the caretakers beat some of the slaves and killed others and wounded others in the head and sent them away empty-handed. Then in verse 6, Jesus describes himself in the story. And he says, finally he sent his beloved son. Yes, Jesus knows who he is in his relationship with God. He is the beloved son. Do you know who you are? We all know John 3.16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him shall not perish but have everlasting life. God so loved the world that he gave this branch, this serpent, this Lord, this Messiah, this King of Kings, he gave his beloved Son as a sacrifice so that the world would not have to die but have everlasting life. Now, do you know who you are? <laughs> some of you do and some of you don't. Read again with me, but this time put yourself in the verse, make it personal, where it says the world, put your name in there or just say me. Read this here with me from the screen. For God so loved me that he gave his only begotten son that if I believe in him, I shall not perish but have everlasting life. Do you know who you are? You are a saint and you are beloved. You need more evidence? Here's part of the greeting of Paul to the church in Rome. To all who are beloved of God. In other words, remember that Kai that we learned in Greek? In other words, as saints, you see the parallel structure there? The beloved of God are those who are called saints. And there are some of you here who are still not convinced because you think you're still too sinful, too wicked, you've done something so terrible that you're convinced in the eyes of God that you are just trash. So let's read it the other way around. Jude 1 verse 1. To those who are called, in other words, the beloved of God the Father, that's you, that's me, passionate as you might be, like David, yet crying out for the sins of your people, like Daniel, imperfect as you are, like the Corinthians, and clinging to Jesus, like the Ephesians, you are the saints. In the grace-faith relationship with God, you are the beloved. Amen. Saints are special people. They're set apart by God for a special purpose. They receive the gift of salvation. They grow by the power of the Spirit. And they become like the Father in their characters. And finally, in the judgment, are they condemned? No. I kept looking, and that horn was waging war with the saints and overpowering them. Until the ancient days came and judgment was passed in favor of the saints. <laughs> Amen. <laughs> of the highest one. And the time arrived when the saints took possession of the kingdom. 
in the final judgment, the saints are given the kingdom. Praise the Lord. But the first characteristic of a saint, the first qualification for a saint, is to know you are greatly beloved. God has emptied all of heaven for you. You are loved intensely, unreservedly, sacrificially, eternally. It's hard for me to get through this presentation because it means so much to me. Do you know who you are? You are a saint and you are great beloved. Amen. Tell you a little story. <clears throat> in my church down there at Arden in North Carolina, as a young person, well, they're not so young anymore, but they were young when this happened. <sighs> the person I will call Joe J-O-E-H, because it could be J-O-E or it could be J-O. The, the gender doesn't matter. You, you don't know the person anyway. Joe was in an unusual relationship, to say the least, <clears throat> with another person when the two of them came visiting our church at Arden. But the relationship did not last. And this other person left the church and joined themselves to someone else and left Joe all alone. Joe stayed in our church and Joe grew in our church until Joe was helping out in the church and leading a Bible study in the church and teaching a Sabbath school class and helping with the drama ministry and leading the food drive for the hungry and heading up the prayer ministry of the church. Joe started a new prayer outreach called 10 Days of Prayer, which happens every year at the beginning of the year, January, hosted by the prayer ministry. And it was, and it still is, a, a tradition that we do every year where one of the church members gives their testimony and then the people respond with their own comments of affirmation, and then we all pray for each other. After several years, notice what I'm saying now, after several years had passed, one year during the 10 days of prayer, Joe stood up to make this response. For the first time, Tonight, I understand that Jesus loves me. I had always known that he loved all of you. But for the first time in my life tonight, I now know he loves me. It really happened. It happened just like that. How long it takes us to discover we are loved by God. Up until that night, Joe had not known that Joe was a saint and Joe was greatly beloved, intensely. You are a saint and greatly beloved. You may have been working and serving and ministering in this church for all your lives, but do you know who you are? You are a saint. You are greatly beloved. You may have been working for so long that you've become discouraged and tired and injured by the church members, maybe by the pastor, and you stop ministering and you stop serving others because you were too tired and too broken to function. Do you know who you are? You are a saint. You are loved. You might be absolutely new to the church. And you may not know about Jesus. You may not know that how he placed 
his hands on your life. You believe in him, but you're not sure what to do next. But do you know that you are loved and you are greatly beloved? Love begins with God. 1 John 4.10 In this is love. Not that we loved God, but that he loved us. And where we started out at the very beginning of this presentation, he predestined us to adoption as sons and daughters through Jesus Christ to himself, according to the kind intention of his will, to the praise of the glory of his grace, which he freely bestowed on us in the Beloved. Just as much as God loves Jesus, he loves you. I, I don't know how this is going to go. Let's see what happens. I want to make a special appeal right here for anyone in this audience who has never known until today that Jesus loves you. To anyone who has forgotten that Jesus loves you, to anyone who's been working so hard in ministry in this church and trying to impress the saints and God and yourself that you're safe to save. And today you've heard loud and clear, maybe for the first time again, that your standing in your relationship with God does not depend upon how hard you worked at it. It depends on the fact that you are beloved. You are a saint. God loves you. It doesn't matter whether you've been working in the church for years or this is the first time that you've come to church today. You are loved. If you've never known that God loves you or that somehow God forgot about you, and now today you've heard this very simple message that you are a saint, and what makes you a saint, first of all, is that you are loved by God. If you fully assured that God loves you, I'd like you to stand just where you are. Amen. I don't know who that is, because there may be somebody here today who's in that very situation. They didn't know. They knew that God loved everybody else. They didn't know he loved you. Because if that's true, if there's someone here today, then I don't want to pass up the opportunity for the rest of you to hold them in your arms and to let them know that they are loved by you and by God. Amen. Now, it could be that all of you have been quite comfortable <laughs> up to this point, and it's not touching your hearts like it's touching mine. We'll talk more about me in the next presentation, but and maybe you'll understand why it means so much to me that God loves me. So, oh, there's the lady who's playing the piano. <laughs> it's time to sing our song. Good morning. I didn't see you come in. <laughs> it's time. It's time. I think we decided it was 190. Mm -hmm. Yes, 190. Now, you know the song. You probably don't have to look it up. It says, Jesus loves me, this I know. It was the response of Elder HMS Richards when somebody asked him, what is righteousness by faith? And he said, Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. So, let's, let's sing it. Jesus loves me, this I know, for the Bible tells me so. Is no one to him belong? They are weak, but he is strong. Yes, Jesus loves me. Yes, Jesus. 
I have loved you that you also love one another. By this all men will know that you are my disciples if you have love for one another. Amen. Oh my Father. We want this to be so in us, in this church, in these hearts. How do we say For such love. Yes. It is so inadequate and that's what we have to say in the English language. Mm -hmm. Draw us near to you and increase our faith. Yes. In the precious name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Amen.